boy, it's a good time to get them out. Can we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and Ephesians chapter 1? 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. I've enjoyed being in the house of God already this morning. But enjoying the presence of God didn't start when I got to church this morning. It started when I was on my knees at the house. And, and, it, and, I, and I can tell you, for many years, as not being the pastor or, or teaching uh, uh, teenagers or, or kids or whatever, that I would often come to the house of God and just cold turkey, just show up. My, is it far better far better worship experience when you show up and your heart is already full and you don't spend time with the Lord in prayer and studying. Woo! I highly recommend it. I, 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 and I fully admit I didn't do it very often as not being the pastor, but boy, if I was ever not a pastor, which I don't think that's even possible, I promise you I'd be getting up on a lot of Sunday mornings and studying and praying and getting ready for the service. Amen. As we turn to these scriptures, I had a couple of co-workers, as, as we often do, trying to be funny and, and make fun of God a little bit, and, the, and I don't remember how he, he got on the subject, but he said, well, you know, he said, God created woman and didn't give her any clothes. And he's trying to be funny and poke at me, you know. <clears throat> but I was really happy to respond to him, and I said, well, you know, um, did you know where the first animal sacrifice came from? He's like, well, probably some pagan religion from thousands of years ago. I said, no, it was God, God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the same God that made Adam and Eve. I said, see, he had to, he had, because they sinned, that God had to kill an animal so they could now have something to wear. I said, we've been wearing clothes ever since. Then I got to tell him, and, and we didn't go into it very deep after that, although we've had these conversations before, um, but I said, you know, that was the first Adam, and that was the first required sacrifice. I said, the last Adam was Jesus Christ, and that he was the last required sacrifice, and then, <laughs> and then we had to start working, but like I had a great segue, but we couldn't go much further, amen. amen. Brother Waddell, would you open the morning uh, message? I'd be honored, sir, if you would. Amen. And to worship you. I pray, Lord, that's why we're even here. And to glean from your word, from the word that you laid on Pastor Duncan's heart. And for what we've heard in Sunday school thus far. It's all about you. Amen. Amen. When Stephen was stoned to death, he was literally preaching the gospel message to the people that were stoning him. We'd like to think that we have enough character to do so, but I, I don't. I don't think we're half the men that they used to be. I, I just can't imagine being stoned to death, first of all. I mean, if we were to be honest with ourselves. But in preaching the gospel message, where did, where did he start? I double-checked because I wanted to make sure I was right. He started with Abraham, and he went on, right? When, when, when Jesus rose from the grave and he met the, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, he, he taught them, Himself, he taught them Jesus through the scriptures. And where did he start? From Moses and the prophets. Right on down. Right? But when, when Philip was witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch, that's an easy one. Where did he begin to teach from? 
Isaiah 53, we all know that. The gospel message didn't begin with Jesus, as some people might think. It ended with Jesus. It was complete with Jesus. Jesus completes the gospel message. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb that was needed to take away the sin of all mankind. And it all started with that first sacrifice, that first animal sacrifice. And Christ is that last sacrifice, amen, the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That last Adam, by the way, is Christ. Howbeit uh, that was not... How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Talking about the original man, Adam. And afterward, that which is spiritual. That's Christ. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. It's a really simple message this morning. And uh, I, I don't say this often. I was telling Brother Shine this morning. I, 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 I try to stay away from one-liners. I try away from trying to over-spiritualize something, even if I feel that way, just because preachers abuse it all the time. doesn't mean it's not true when they say it. I'm just saying I know it's abused all the time to try to make themselves look like, oh, man, I've got something from God. And they just want to look like something, in my opinion, oftentimes. But I'll say this, I had an entirely different message that I was about a third way through, and it was on a completely different topic, and uh, God just tugged my heart on this. I can't remember who it was, it was somebody like, uh, oh, Tony probably know, some great evangelist, I can't remember who it was, it's like Spurgeon or somebody. He said that God was tugging at his heart to, to preach a John 3.16 message. And he kept thinking, but Lord, they'll think I haven't studied. And they haven't, Lord, I haven't prepared. But he just kept having this nudge to preach a John 3.16 message. So he did. And God moved in a big way. Amen. Point number one this morning. And just because it's a simple message, please don't tune out. All the more reason to tune in. Number one, God is long-suffering. And I don't know about you, but God's been awfully good to me. I mean, like, he's been really good to me. I, I, I think like many of us, we could just start writing. And I've done this, and I encourage you to do it. You, you want to have some revival in your heart, in your prayer life? Just start writing the things that God's done for you. God's given me a really nice house. God's given me a really good family, great wife. I'm thankful for that nice flex we got. My explorer needs a little help. I'm thankful for that, too. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful God, for some reason, allowed me to be a pastor when I never, ever, ever, ever had a desire to be in any way, shape, or form. But now I can't imagine anything different. I'm thankful for the job that I have. I'm thankful for, for, for how he has led me from one place to another. And, and I can look back and see, wow, God did this in my life, and it was really, really hard and that made no sense at the time. And, I, and I'm not much of a crier anymore, but there was times when I was on my knees literally bawling my eyes out because I didn't understand why God was allowing this to happen. But really, it was to get me to this place, physically and spiritually. Often both at the same time. I was born a sinner, and I have sinned so much in my life. So much. Uh, it seems like the greatest sinners become the greatest Christians, don't it? And I would only attribute that, that to maybe because they have a better understanding of how awful that they could be. Maybe. As opposed to the, the preacher's kid that grows up in a, in a good Christian home hypothetically, right, and they think that they're above everybody else maybe because they're on some spiritual plane because they're in their lineage of the pastor or something ridiculous like that. But here's the thing. With, with how wicked that I am, 
even now in my flesh? And how wicked you are now and the wicked things that you've done and the wicked things that you're going to possibly do. That God knew that. Before the foundation of the earth was even a thing, he knew that. And he knew what you would do. He knew the, the habitual sin you continue in. He knew the awful things that, that would happen in your life. The things that you would allow in your life. Yet he chose to die for you anyways. <laughs> like, when we get our resurrected bodies to those of us who are saved and born again, and we're in heaven, I would think maybe we'll understand it then, but we may never for eternity understand why God loves us so much. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood that's his sacrifice on the cross the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace some would say predestinated it just means that there's predestined he has predetermined benefits for those who call upon him amen and and you know <laughs> it's personal he's a personal savior to me but he's a personal savior to anyone who calls on him. You know, that song, he loves me like I was his only child. I never felt so loved before. I could never ask for more. That song gets to me because it's true. It's true. We have a God that loves us like we're literally his only child. God knew that Eve was going to eat of the tree of, uh, of life, amen, that Adam would eventually too, thus having to kick him out of the Garden of Eden, place of paradise. God knew the pain. Is, you know, we can't imagine that suffering. Think about it. Going from paradise to opposite of that. I'm talking like all of a sudden now, you're sweating way more, and you're working way more than you ever had to for what you're getting out of it, amen. You're now having to sacrifice animals for, 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 for clothing and, and for food, I'm sure, at some point. We don't know the, the burden. We don't understand the extent of the burden that they experienced. Amen. But God knew the pain and suffering that was ahead. The first child born would become a murderer killing his brother. Yet God decided that it would be worth it to create mankind. Because it's real easy to look around the world throughout history and even now, and you just turn on the news. There's devastation all over. I mean, you want to talk about signs of the times? Uh, Paul talked about signs of the times back then. Man, if he could see it now, he would say, it is imminent. The Lord's going to come back soon. <coughs> the world got so bad after... 14, 1500 years that he destroyed the entire thing with water, with a flood. Now think about that. Think about this. They were living seven, eight, nine hundred years, right? So there's probably more people alive than that had died at that point. I'm just talking out loud there. I, that's, I didn't look at the numbers or calculate the numbers. What I'm saying is there's a whole lot of generational uh, 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 tribal knowledge. It wasn't just like, like, oh, it was so long ago, we didn't hear anything about it. It's like, no, no, you're talking, you're talking to direct descendants of people that come out of the garden. Amen. Right? right? It's not, it wasn't such a long time that they knew all about God, yet they still rebelled against God. Right. Maybe a bitterness because they didn't get to enjoy the garden. I wonder how Eve might have had a hard life. I, I can only imagine the bitterness because people are awful. 
people are the worst. And they probably treated her awfully. I'm just speculating. Don't quote me on that. But it didn't take very long for the, the entire world to be awful. I mean, we're talking, and I think he mentioned it, but Tony mentioned it in Sunday school. <clears throat> There's a small number of people, and it's really Noah. And God allowed Noah to bring his boys with him and their wives. Amen. After the flood, a man named Nimrod decided to build a tower that could, and the, the purpose of the tower, yeah, it was to, to reach God, it, it was mentioned, but really it was to survive another flood. The, the, the tower was, was built out of rebellion to an almighty God, like, as if to say, yeah, flood us again and we'll survive. That's what Nimrod was doing, the wicked people. I think he was descendants of Cain, I'm not sure. Right after that, God decided to make his own very own nation, Israel, through a man named Abraham, father of the Jews, although he wasn't even a Jew himself. God literally created a nation, a race of people for himself. It's pretty amazing. And it would be through that very bloodline that God would bring the Savior of all mankind. And all along the way through his people, teaching that the importance in the... In the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, um, the necessity of sacrifice, blood sacrifice. It's foreign to us nowadays because we don't see it. But boy, it is absolutely biblical. And, and God had, uh, through his people, he was showing them uh, through all these sacrifices and, and all these perfect little lambs that they would have to sacrifice or little pigeons and whatever it was, whatever they could afford, all pointed to the actual sacrifice that would one day have to be made. And his name is Jesus Christ. And you might ask, why are you bringing this up? Because that is just a really, really broad picture. A really, really broad picture of the long suffering of an almighty God. I don't know about you, but when I have to get a spanking from my dad, it's been a few years, by the way, <laughs> and hopefully I don't get any more. But when I have to get a spanking and he sends me to my room, that's as bad or worse than the spanking itself. I think we've all been there. Amen. I, I know he's God, but he still went through the pain and suffering it, in human form. He went through pain and suffering like no man has ever gone before. Because it wasn't just physical, it was spiritual. We can't even fathom that. To bear the sins of all mankind spiritually, we can't fathom that. But just consider this for a moment. Before time, as we know it, before God literally made time as we know it, before the foundations of the earth, God knew that he would have to sacrifice himself for the creation of man that he made. And he would spend roughly 4,000 years waiting for that day. And it wouldn't have been waiting in anticipation like I'm so excited for it, but waiting in knowing how painful and awful it's going to be, but that it had to be done. You want to talk about majesty and character and worthy? Like, like that verse in Revelation, and <laughs> the, he said, who is worthy? Amen? Jesus is. He is the lamb. He is worthy. Amen? It, it would be after the flood, another 2,500 years before Christ came, he put himself on that cruel cross. A time in history where man was at its cruelest in their punishments. Still talked about today. That was a point in history where the Romans were so torturous and cruel. That's when God chose to take his life for us. Here we are 2,000 years later. And God still putting up with us, neglecting him. 
forgetting about him. Putting him, putting God as a, eh, I'll give you a little bit of time on Sunday and the whole rest of the week, forget about it. Number one, God is long-suffering. Number two, salvation is for sinners. I know we all know it, but let's turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. I titled the message, The Only Way to Heaven. <clears throat> it's not a mystery. It's not hidden. There's songs that say things like, I found the secret. I know the secret. It's not a secret. Right. It's, been, it's been preached since mankind has been alive. Right. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. Right. You're either looking to the cross or you're looking back at the cross. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we could, we, could, we could stay there all day long and rejoice. We could go home right now and say, glory to God, he still saves sinners. Glory to God, God is still all long-suffering. You know what verse doesn't get a lot of attention in the next verse, which is possibly just as good as 16. Look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Man, I'm thankful for that. There's always a man I used to work with. He always called it, uh, he, he would say, I don't have to live by your book of rules. And he would say that, and it would make him bitter every time he'd think about it, which shows your heart issue, shows a heart issue. That right there is enough to tell me that God loves sinners in spite of their sin. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Man, I'm thankful. He loved us not just while we were sinners, for a gem before we was even born. Before the foundation of the earth even uh, began, God said, you know what? I love Brother Jim Vipon. I love Brother Ron Phillips. Amen. I bro love Brother Waddell. I know a man personally that would not accept Christ as a Savior because of the bad things that he did in his life. And I, he would never say what he did. I, my imagination runs wild. That man died and went to hell. That's what the Bible teaches, not what the Baptist, Baptist preacher says. This man was close friends with Joe Hicks. I mean, I mean, almost every night he was with him. But he refused to get saved. He knew what salvation was. He knew that he was a sinner and he needed salvation, but he refused to get saved because he says, I've done too many things wrong. Folks, that's pride. That's pride. It doesn't matter what you've done. God's grace is still sufficient. I don't believe with all my heart that Adolf Hitler went to heaven. I don't believe he was saved. But I'll say this, that Hitler or any Nazi soldier that did those horrific atrocities, even them who, those are some of the worst sinners that we can imagine, God's got enough grace for every one of them if they just ask for forgiveness with all their heart. I remember in a high school locker room, can we turn to Matthew chapter 12, 31? Oh, you already see it. That's awesome. I love that. That's so cool. I remember in the high school locker room, a young kid was telling everybody that if you talk bad about the Holy Ghost, then, then you will go to hell. And it caused me to look in my Bible and think, man, what's he talking about? But let's take a look at that portion of Scripture. First of all, that's not what it means, by the way. But look at Matthew 12, 31. Jesus said, because his words are read, we know it's Jesus talking. 
It says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. What did Jesus mean when he said that? Does that mean that Jesus isn't forgiving? I thought he's a loving God. Doesn't he forgive of all sin? It says right there in the first part of it, all manner of sin and blasphemy should be forgiven unto all men except for one. Does that mean Jesus is not long-suffering? No, we know he's long-suffering. It means that if you don't accept the Holy Ghost for who he is, then you will not inherit eternal life. Let's just back that up with scripture, shall we? Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That's the Trinity. We know that. You don't have to turn there, but John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that? Jesus. Amen. And we beheld his glory, and the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you reject Jesus, you reject the Holy Ghost. So it begs the question, how do you accept Jesus? How do you accept Jesus as your personal Savior? By accepting him for who he really is. The Son of God that was and is the sacrificial lamb that needed to take place to take away the sins of all mankind. Because there's no works that any of us can do. It ought to be telling, if you look at all religions in all the world, and you look at biblical Christianity, they are all works-based. All of them are. Every single one. Even within denominations that claim to be Christian, many are works-based, if you look them up and search. To understand who Jesus is, you're acknowledging it's to acknowledge that you are a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. Repenting of your sins and asking Christ to literally save you from your sins. There's one caveat, though. There's a caveat to that. You want to know what it is? You have to mean it with all your heart. And as simple as that is, that's so hard for some people. Because there's people in the Bible that literally saw Lazarus raised from the dead after four days. They saw it. That wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. All the miracles that were done, if God showed up and did some great miracle, there's still people that would deny him. They would deny him because denying him would be giving up their heart. So as simple as it is to give Christ your heart and say, Lord, I accept you as my personal Savior. For some people, they do not want to let that go. Because what does that mean? That means that now I have to acknowledge that you are my authority. But whatever you say goes, and people don't want to give that up. So then they'll find a religion or denomination that suits them. And now they can do the things that they want to do and justify themselves in the sin that they want to live in. We want to say things like, because we don't want to offend anybody, right, is the main mentality nowadays. And we want to say things that are like, you know, um, they don't believe the truth and that would be true and, and, and um, they're not sticking with what Jesus said and how to get to heaven and that would be true. But we don't want to say things that are offensive like, that's satanic, or that is wicked, or that's the, the devil using those people to, 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 to dismay other people, amen, by the thousands and millions. See, the truth is, John the Baptist, the disciples, Jesus, I mean, they're calling them vipers. They're calling them, I mean, uh, what did Jesus call Peter? Didn't he, didn't he call him Satan? I mean, Jesus didn't hold nothing back. So why are we trying to shallow things up? 
Because we live in a day where everyone gets offended for everything. Can I tell you this morning that it's not, a, it's not saying a prayer that gets you into heaven. And if you're watching online, it's, it's not a prayer that you say. It's not magical words. It's not the act of repeating after somebody. And I'm not against helping somebody, like maybe a child, maybe that, that, that is struggling with the words to say, but it's not a mouth issue. It's a heart issue. I mean, the, the man on the cross, he just acknowledged that he's Jesus. And he, he, with the he just, he just acknowledged that he was Jesus. And God said, Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise today, Amen. He didn't go through a creed. He didn't say the sinner's prayer word for word. He didn't go through some traditional thing. He didn't come down to an altar. Did you know that you can get saved right in your seat? You can get saved anywhere. It didn't have to be in an altar. Thank God for an altar. We ought to be using an altar a whole lot more. But it's Jesus plus nothing. Red Tony used that, and I like it. Jesus saves. Jesus plus nothing. <laughs> It's all Jesus and nothing else. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How are we become a new creature? Because as sinners, we are born spiritually dead. But through accepting the shed blood of Jesus Christ with all of our heart, we become spiritually alive. We are literally born again. Anyone who will ever enter heaven is going to have two births, physical and a spiritual. And the new birth, and this is awesome. I hope you're staying with me. Give me just two, three more minutes. The, the new birth comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we literally have God residing in our house of flesh. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. I love that, man. There's no, no one's turn. You're there already. That's so cool. Ephesians 1.13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. How did he purchase that? By giving his life on the cross. When you get saved, there's a change that happens within you. And you will not enjoy sin like you once did. The Holy Spirit will now convict you every single time. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 12. We'll turn to two more scriptures and we'll close. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were, look at this, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's talk about that second birth again. If you go home, you could read John chapter 3. You, you want to talk about going to heaven and say, well, what does the Bible say about it? Well, you could look and see exactly what Jesus said about it. And it's John chapter 3. It's really simple. Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to have a physical birth and a spiritual birth. You must be born again to have eternal life. Can we turn to Revelations chapter 22, verse 17? That's the very last page of the Word of God. The very last page. And I understand that not everyone is going to get saved. And that's heartbreaking. It really is. I mean, you think of, it's heartbreaking. There are kind people, kind people that are going to burn in hell for eternity. There are very religious people that are going to burn in hell for all of eternity. There are going to be people that call themselves Christians for a lifetime that are going to burn in hell for all of eternity. 
And this is where people don't like the Baptist preacher. But I'm telling you, this is what Scripture says. Right. Matthew 7, 21. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? Have we not done many wonderful works in that in thy name? And they'll say, depart from me, I never knew you, you that work in equity. That's Jesus. It's not the Baptist preacher. The more wicked the world gets, the more rebellious, the further away we get from truth, the more offensive the truth becomes. So when you get a preacher that's preaching truth, I'm not talking about the preachers that preach hatefully, but preachers that are preaching the truth out of love, having compassion, making a difference. Amen. But for those who would come to the knowledge of the truth, can I encourage you to not wait for the perfect time to get saved? To make sure that maybe you want to, well, I'm going to hit this goal, then maybe I'll get things spiritually right in my life. Please don't, please don't gamble eternity that way. Amen. Scripture says that life is but a vapor. I mean, e even from, uh, I mean, from God's standpoint, I mean, I can't, um, I'm, it's probably just literally like a vapor. But as I see as we're getting older, all of a sudden, Christmas comes sooner and sooner every year. As parents, like, we see this, and it's like, what, what, it's Christmas time already? And all of a sudden, we're looking back, and we're like, wow, the last five years, where'd it go? Where'd the last ten years go? I'm literally now, just now starting to talk in 20-year blocks in my life. That's sad. That's sad. But even from our perspective, We've only got 20 or 30 years of, of really, really physically able to serve God. What are we going to do with it? I'm talking to the Christian. We got this, this is our window. Because we're going to reach an age where we're, we're not going to be able to get out and do so much. And, and there's, there's an age. And I'm not saying a guy can't use an old person or a young person. But it will be limited. You've got a span in the middle of that that God can, you can do so much more physically for the cause of Christ. The problem is Satan really attacks that middle ground. Satan really attacks that middle ground. and He doesn't want people to get saved. He doesn't want Christians to serve the Lord. He's doing everything he can because he knows his time is short. Revelation 22, 17, we'll close with this. And the spirit and the bride say, come. We're the bride, by the way. That's the church. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The best decision that I ever made in all my life was when I was seven years old. I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. Man, best thing all day long. And I would hope that you have a testimony where you, you could point to a specific time and a place when you got saved. It'd be nice if you knew when uh, exactly the date was. I don't know exactly the date was. I know it was uh, a, about a week before I turned eight. I don't know what, date, what day it was or the date. But if you can't remember a time and a place when God changed your life, when you, when you made a conscious decision to say, Lord... I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to serve you. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, and I, I, I acknowledge that you, you are the Savior, not just of the world, but of me personally, Lord. I want to give my life to you, and I want to serve you. Amen. If you can't think of a time or point to a time when that's ever happened to you, can I encourage you to come to an altar this morning? As the pianist comes, we'll... We'll sing a hymn.